Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, being flexible and meeting online this morning. Let's see, did you guys all get the, the um, recording question? I wanna make sure that it's recording. Yes, okay, great. Thanks. Um, it won't let me record in the way that I'm used to recording when I'm sharing my iPad on Zoom. So anyway, um, <clears throat> let's get started. So last time we were talking about overfitting and underfitting. And so we have, um, <clears throat> this picture is a pretty good one to illustrate the concept. So our data are these dots. And as you can see, if I try to use a linear model to fit this data set, <clears throat> it's not gonna do a good job. It's not capturing uh, the underlying behavior of that data set. On the other hand, if I use a very complicated model, it's possible to pass through all the data points perfectly <clears throat> to achieve zero error on this data set. But the issue is that when we, this is just the training data, later when we wanna use our trained model on some data that we haven't seen during the training time, we might get samples that are similar to those dots, but then far away from this complicated line that we fit. So that's an indication that we have overfitted <clears throat> on our training data. What we'd like to do is something like in the middle here, where we come up with <clears throat> some sort of prediction curve that matches the, um, the average behavior of the data, but doesn't get distracted by the noise in the data and the kind of randomness that's gonna be in the training data, but not in the test data that we're gonna see later. <clears throat> so that's the, uh, the main issue. And we are talking about polynomial models in this particular um, <clears throat> demo or experiment, but actually these ideas apply much more generally anytime we have a sequence of different models with different complexities, we have to choose the model complexity and that's gonna affect this choice. So, um, so last time we said, what about trying this naive idea where what we do is we come up with a sequence of hypotheses about the model order for every one of our hypothesized model orders D. We design D plus one coefficients. We fit them with least squares. Then we use those uh, trained models to predict the target labels, and then we compute the target RSS, and we plot the target RSS here, and we see what happens. And we would like to eventually choose the D that minimizes the uh, the training RSS. And the problem with this approach is it doesn't work because what happens is, as a model gets more and more complicated, it's just going to do better and better and better at fitting our training data until finally it's going to achieve zero error. And, um, and we're gonna just choose the most complicated of all the models that we've uh, hypothesized. So <clears throat> we don't wanna take this approach. Um, we wanna do something called cross-validation and that brings us to today's lecture. So in cross-validation, the main idea <clears throat> is that when you evaluate the performance of these different models, you evaluate it on test data that's independent of the training data. So um, as we'll see, there's different ways of doing this. The simplest way of doing this is to partition your total data set into two subsets, one of which has training samples and the other of which has test samples. And you fit your model on the training data and then you evaluate the performance on the test data. And so if we do this here, repeating the same experiment as before, the blue dots are from the previous page, and then the green dots are now evaluated on the, the test set, we can see that at least in this particular experiment, the test error is minimum at the true model or order, and then it slowly increases after that. So here, again, just 
training on the uh, on the training data, using that model to test on the test data, and then finding the model order, which gives the best performance on that test data or test fold, as we'll call them. That leads to uh, us finding the true model order. Now, this is not guaranteed to work. It doesn't always work this way. In fact, we're going to talk about other techniques that are going to be a bit more robust to this later in this unit. But um, at least in this experiment, it works. And you can see the general trend is that the, the RSS goes down and then it increases after some point. Okay. If there's any questions, uh, just feel free to type in the chat um, or uh, you know, raise your hand or, or something and I'll, I'll try to uh, stop and answer your question. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the idea behind cross-validation. So like that's, like I said, the simplest approach to cross-validation. Here's another approach that's more complicated, but um, it overcomes some of the, uh, well, actually, actually, let's talk for a second more about this. So what are the disadvantages of this simple approach? So uh, one thing that we haven't really seen clearly yet, but we'll see it, um, we'll see it later in this unit, is that, <clears throat> Generally speaking, we want as many training data samples as we can access. And the problem with this approach is that we end up giving up some of our training data samples and using them as tests. So the final number of training samples we have is fewer. Um, so the same, the same issue occurs for the test samples. The more test samples we have, the more robust of an estimate we're going to get of the performance on unseen data. So we want as many test samples as possible. We want as many training samples as possible. But here we can see we have a direct trade-off. The less training or the less test I have, the more training I have and, and vice versa. Okay, so that brings us to this more um, capable and slightly more complicated approach called K-fold cross-validation. And this picture illustrates the idea pretty well. So you start out like like before with your uh, your data. This is let's say it's called the training set here. Just assume this is all the data you were given. And what you do is you first split it into um, a training and test fold, <clears throat> where in particular you split up your training sets into k different pieces capital k pieces and in this particular example this is k equals 10. so then what we're going to do is the first iteration we're going to use nine of them as training and one of them as test and we're going to compute from this the rss on the test fold fold and store that as e1 error one Next, we're going to repeat that, but we're going to use this uh, fold here as a test fold, and then all the rest as training. And this test error will be reported and stored in E2. And then next, we use this one as test and everything else as training. And the process continues all the way until the end. And because k equals 10, we've done 10 iterations. We now have 10 different estimates of the test error, one for each of these folds. And then finally, we average them all together and we get our final estimate of the test error. <clears throat> so this is k-fold cross-validation. Typically, you do this with k equals 5 or 10. <clears throat> um, as you can see, one of the benefits of this relative to the simple approach is that we get to use all of our data uh, for training and for tests, but just in different ways. So, um, so all the data is seen eventually um, for both training and test. And um, let's see, uh, one disadvantage of this approach is it's expensive in the sense that you have to train 10 different models, right? So. If, if it takes you a long time to train a model, well, now you're gonna, it's gonna take you K times as long. So for that reason, this approach is not 
is not often used when your model training is very lengthy, such as with uh, deep neural networks. Deep neural networks, you tend to use this simple approach here. But when we deal with a lot of the models like linear regression and the things we're talking about lately, uh, K-fold cross-validation would be the preferred approach uh, compared to the simple one. Um, <clears throat> there's another kind of extreme case of K-fold cross-validation, and that's called leave one out cross-validation. And that's simply K-fold where K equals N, where N is the total number of samples. So what that means is that your test fold always has one sample in it, and then all the rest of the samples are in the training fold. So this is very expensive because you're going to have n total iterations. You have to design your model n times where n is the size of your data set. So if you have a small data set, that's OK. But if you have a large data set, then that becomes uh, infeasible. So, um, <clears throat> so those are the main, main ideas behind k-fold cross-validation. Um, I'll say a couple more things. Once you're done with your cross-validation and you have, you've computed this test error, now typically what you do is you actually do this for every hypothesis of the model you're interested in testing. So if I, if I have, and we'll see this on the next page, if I have several different um, model orders to evaluate, I have to do this whole thing for each model order. But once I'm done, once I've decided my model order, the very last step is to go back to your full training set and design your model on the full training data. So we're doing this stuff only for model order selection. Once we have selected our model, we come back here and we use the full training data set to uh, train our model. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so those are the main things. So let's see, there's a question in the chat. So you get K different models. How do you select the final model? No, you don't get K models. Um, <clears throat> so everything on this page is for one type of model. Okay, great. You got, got, the, question, got the question answered. Um, any other questions? I know that sometimes the first, first time you see this, it might be a little complicated, but I'm happy to answer more questions on <clears throat> K-fold cross-validation. Any more questions? No? <clears throat> okay. So, um, so here's, here's the, the full picture then. How do we use K-fold cross-validation to evaluate D different model orders? And essentially, you do this in, with two nested for loops. So you have an outer loop that goes over your K-folds, and you have an inner loop that evaluates your D different model orders. So for example, just to look at the picture, in this case here, we had um, 10 different model orders. So if I have five folds and 10 model orders, I actually have to compute 50 different models uh, or 50 different, I have to train 50 different models. Okay, so it's instructive to look at the code just a little bit. Um, so here's the, the, the outer loop. Here's the inner loop. Um, what you can see the goal is, the goal is to finally compute the RSS for every model index, little d. So little d is, is you know, cycling over your model orders. And for every uh, fold iteration k, that's cycling over your k folds. So your, your goal is to fill out this matrix of RSS values. And you can see that matrix is being filled out here, the last step. So, um, so you have two different counters here. So, so it is like the, um, let's see, it would be the, like your little, your little D over here. And then I split is the other counter over here. And that would be like your, like your K over here. Um, and in this, in this particular experiment, what we're doing here, you can see we're fitting uh, the polynomial coefficients down here. And we're fitting it using the training 
uh, targets and labels. And then we are evaluating it using the test, uh, test features. And, um, and this gives us predictions of the test labels. And then over here, we're computing the mean across that what's in that test fold. Now, probably the most interesting thing is how we're using sklearn to help us with this. So if you look at what's happening over here, this is where we have to create the, um, the set of training data, training features and training labels, and test features and test labels. In order to construct those data sets, we need to know what the index sets are. We need to know, like, you know, if I'm if I'm at one of these folds here, I need to know all the indices that make up the training, and I need to know which are the indices that make up the test. And as you can see, here's my training indices, here's my test indices. Those are getting pulled out of this tuple, IND, and IND is actually coming from, it's being extracted from a list of things that this k-fold object is giving us. So here is where we're using sklearn. We're saying to sklearn, make us a k-fold object that uses n splits and shuffles the data. I'll talk about the shuffling in a second. And, um, and then finally, what that k-fold object is doing here is it's saying, OK, I'm going to give you a list of the training and test indices. So this would be like the first list item would be these. The second list item would be these. The third list item would be these, and so on. And then there's a nice feature in, in, uh, in Python. You'll notice it being used both here and here where when you create a for loop, you can cycle over two different types of counters. So let me focus on this, it's a little bit easier. So dtest is just a list of the model orders we wanna test. Um, it could start at zero, it could start at one, it could start at two or whatever. It's just a list of different model orders. And what we're doing is we're extracting um, different, different model orders from that list into the D variable. This D variable might not start at zero or one. It, it's just gonna go over the different elements here. But if I wanna have an additional counter, that's just a simple counter that starts counting at zero, one, two, I can do that here. So this is where you have the for it, comma, D, in, enumerate. This is what it's, it's doing is it's giving us a simple counter as well as pulling objects out of that list. And the same thing is going here. I have a simple counter. And then end is pulling objects from this list. And in this case, those objects are training uh, test pairs of indices. Okay, so there's a lot of different interesting things going on in this piece of code. Um, I just wanted to explain. So this is the k-fold method generates index sets for the folds. All right. Any, any questions on? what the code is doing, making sense, All right? Now, as we'll see, there's actually, this is sort of a, what I would call a manual method of doing it. You don't always have to code these, these nested for loops. There's actually, sklearn gives you a much more concise way of doing this, but the first time we're seeing it, it just helps to understand exactly what's going on uh, so that you, you understand um, yeah, exactly what's going on. So um, yeah, one last uh, thing I'd like to emphasize is this shuffling. So um, by shuffling, what we mean is coming back here, at the very first step, you randomly shuffle all the elements in your training data set. And let me explain why you might need to do this or definitely want to do this in most cases. So sometimes the training set is organized in a peculiar way. So for example, if I'm doing um, regression, maybe for some reason, the, the labels in my training data set are organized from small to big. And if I don't shuffle them around, then what happens is 
I'm using, I would be using here all the small labels to try to predict the big labels and so on. And that's really going to give me very weird results. So what you should try to do is you want this test fold to be representative of what happens on average with your data. So what you want to do is just shuffle things around, do a random reordering. And then finally, the test fold will just be random samples of what happened in your original training data. Okay, so shuffling is important to do. We're, we're specifically turning it on here. And um, sometimes I think by default, sklearn does not turn it on. So you have to turn it on explicitly and, and don't forget to do that. <clears throat> okay, all right, any questions on shuffling? Okay. So, um, so let's, let's look a little bit deeper and there's something else that we get out of cross-validation beyond just um, the, beyond just this line over here. So we can, we can get these points. These are just the, the average uh, test errors for each model order. We can, we can definitely do that. But k-fold cross-validation actually gives us another interesting piece of, of information, which is the fact that whenever we compute an average, unless we use an infinite number of points in computing that average, um, our average is not going to be perfect, right? Like if I, if I say I have um, maybe a, a, a coin that's biased, so sometimes when I when I flip it, I'm going to get more heads than tails. And I ask you exactly what is the bias on there? Well, you can figure out what the bias is by flipping it a number of times. You can see, oh, it's coming up more heads than tails. But if you really want to get you know, a perfectly accurate estimate of exactly what the probability of heads is versus tails, you need to flip it an infinite number of times. We'll actually talk about this uh, in more detail soon. but I think you can get the intuition. So when we do our k-fold cross-validation, and you know when k is small, which is you know maybe five or ten, those are not very big numbers. We would like to acknowledge that the estimates of the um, of the the RSS that I'm getting. This is just as you can see. This is the estimate by averaging over our uh, capital K different folds. We're going to get this estimate. We want to acknowledge that that's not perfect. And in fact, one of the ways that we can acknowledge that is by looking at the variation among those, those different elements in the average. The more variation we see in those, uh, that's going to be a clue that we have more uncertainty in this estimate. And in particular, we can use uh, this formula. Uh, we can use a quantity called the standard error. And the standard error is just basically, it's like a way of estimating the, yeah, basically the error on the estimate. <clears throat> so the definition of it looks like this. You take the standard deviation of this, the RSS D, data, and I'll explain exactly how we get that in a moment, and you divide by the square root of k or the square root of the number of things that you have averaged. And um, <clears throat> okay, what about the standard deviation? So we already learned about computing sample variance in, uh, in the last unit, actually the first unit. And if you look at what's inside the square root, this is similar to what we learned. You take the sample mean of the data, and then you look at the average squared uh, deviation from the sample mean. But here, you're seeing that instead of using one over k, we're using one over k minus one. And if you remember, I mentioned back then that sometimes you use one over k, sometimes you use one, one over k minus one. And this one over k minus one, gives us what's called an unbiased estimate of this variance. We're going to learn about bias very soon. And I'm going to give you, you know, 
In fact, there's a handout that we'll see a little bit later where I, where I derive the fact that this is in fact an unbiased estimate of variance. But here we're seeing it for the first time. And I just wanted to point out that instead of using one over K, we're using one over K minus one to help us with some of the small sample effects. Okay, when, when K is small, this is gonna help us. So this is the standard deviation, the, the, sorry, what's inside here is the, an unbiased estimate of the sample variance. And then if, as you know, we take the square root and that gives us an unbiased, or it, it gives us an estimate of the, the standard deviation. And then we take that standard deviation and we divide by square root of K. And the square root of K, the fact that we're dividing by something to do with K should be intuitive because as we talked about with the coin flip experiment, the intuition is that the more times I, I flip, the more experiments I average, I should be getting a more and more accurate estimate of what's going on. And so the larger K is, the smaller my standard error. So those are all the intuitions. Let's take a look and a plot of what's going on. We're going to use the, um, the error bars, which are these little vertical bars to show the standard error. And this is as a function of D. So D is the model order here. The, um, the line, as before, <clears throat> you know, the centers of the error bars are just the the um, our estimate of the RSS at D. This estimate is just the sample mean estimate. So we have the sample mean in the center and the deviation from that is shown by this standard error. So when you look at this, you notice down here, the sample error is quite large. And the intuition is even though we're guessing that this is the RSS bar for D equals zero, Actually, we're acknowledging that anything within this range here is, is plausible as well. Over here, you can see that the error bars are tighter, which means we're more confident about what's happening. So anything within this range is plausible. And as we go to the right, we're more and more confident. And you can see like at the end here, the error bars are quite tight. So we're in, in conclusion, we're we have a way of computing these error bars or computing how much we should trust the, um, the reported results from our K-fold cross-validation. And we'll see just in a moment, we wanna do this because there's actually some, there's a nice rule we can apply that brings in this uh, uncertainty information into account. So um, in terms of the implementation, how exactly, do you do this? So let's just take a quick look at the code. So here we have just NumPy mean of RSSTS. So notice that this RSSTS, this is a matrix. This is a matrix. And when you go down the rows, that indexes over your different model hypotheses. When you go across the columns, that index across your folds. And here, when you take the mean of a matrix, you, you want to, you need to tell sklearn, do you, do you take the mean over the rows or over the columns? So here we're saying use axis equals one. So remember, Python always starts counting at zero. Um, so if it was zero, that would mean take the average this way. So you'd be averaging those and you'd get a different, an average for every K. We don't want that. We want an average RSS for every D. So we, we tell it use axis equals one, and then it will average the rows like that. And it will give us uh, a vector of averaged RSSs, one for each D. Okay, so that's the first step. Then we do the standard error. And you can see we just use NumPy STD, standard deviation. Again, same axis as before, same data matrix. But here's an important thing. This, uh, D, I think it's degrees of freedom. I can't remember what the first D is. This number here 
maps to this number that we're subtracting. So if you wanted this to just read one over K, you could write DDOF equals zero. If you want it to be one over K minus one, you say DDF equals one. If for some reason you wanted one over K minus two, you would put in DDOF equals two. So this is controlling this, which is giving us that unbiased estimate. And that's how we compute these quantities, the, the, the mean and the, um, the standard error. Here with the standard error, you can see it's the standard deviation divided by square root of K. Finally, to make the plot, we can use the error bar command where it, we just tell it the, the mean, which is the, the values on the line. And then we tell it to use for the error bars themselves to use this RSSSE and it will, it will create that line for us. <laughs> okay, so that was a bunch of information, but at the end of the day, we have a nice way of seeing how much to trust the results of K-fold cross-validation. Are there any questions so far? Okay, great. <clears throat> so here's something interesting that we can do with this information. We can we can um, can use it for what's called the one standard error rule. And if you if you do a bunch of experiments, <clears throat> different data sets, you'll you'll see that if all you do is choose D to minimize the um, the sample mean RSS, you'll see that it might tend to overfit the true model order, meaning it's going to give you D's that are larger than you would like. So here's another example. I think this comes from the, um, the demo. And these values here, are all, they're all pretty similar, but actually the very lowest one is here. So if what we would do is just simply <clears throat> say, I want the D that minimizes the test RSS as computed by K-fold cross-validation, I would choose D equals five. And that would be wrong. We know that the true D is three. So here's a little trick that can help this make this more robust. So it's called the one standard error rule. And it goes like this. You choose the simplest model that gives an RSS bar D within one standard error of the minimum RSS bar D. <clears throat> so the, the colors here help. So this is D min. So I look and, okay, so the blue, this is RSS bar as a function of D. Here I'm, D is going on the horizontal axis. So D min, D min is the, um, is the D that minimizes RSS bar D. So as we know, that's five, D min is five. Then we want the model giving uh, the simplest model giving RSS bar D within one standard error of the minimum. So to find one standard error of the minimum, we just go to the very top of the error bar. <clears throat> We're gonna give this a name. This is called RSS target. So we take RSS bar at D min, which is right in the center there. We add one standard error at D min, which is brings us to the top of the error bar we call that RSS target, and that's that orange dotted line. So here's our RSS bar target. The last step is find the smallest D, which is the simplest in this case. So let me, simplest. Find the smallest D such the RSS bar at that D is below the RSS bar target. <clears throat> so let's come back to the plot. So if I look at um, what's happening at D equals four and it's a little bit, well, yeah, you can see it. The blue line at four is below the dash line. So that's simpler than this. Great, can I make it even simpler? Yes. I can go to three. 
the blue line at d equals three is lower than the target. So that's even simpler. Can I go even simpler? No. When I go to two, I find that the blue line is above the target. So this fails that uh, one standard error rule. So the simplest model, we'll call it D one standard error, OSE, is gonna be where that green vertical line is. That's the simplest model whose RSS bar D lies below the target. <clears throat> so intuitively you're saying anything, any kind of RSS is in that range are reasonable. So find me the simplest model that gives a reasonable RSSD. And in this case, it turns out to be this, which is the true model order. Okay, so that's, that's what we were hoping to see. So again, even this is not bulletproof. It can fail in some cases, but this is a much more robust approach than simply minimizing RSS bar over D is using the one standard error rule. All right. Any questions on this approach? Okay, you sure there's no questions? Because <clears throat> I'm more than happy to, to answer them. And I encourage people to ask because if one person has a question, usually many people have the same question. Okay, so this is definitely something that you'll see on the on the homework. You're, it's not unusual to see this on exams and so on, <clears throat> and it will help with your final project in most cases. Okay, so if it's making sense, that's great. <clears throat> Can move on. So I just want to make a bit of a clarification. Um, we've been talking about <clears throat> splitting up your data into two different subsets, training and test. But I wanna point out that as you go out into the wider field of machine learning, you might see people splitting up three ways. We'll call it training, test, and validation. So what does this mean? So <clears throat> we'll describe it this way. Training data is the data used to train your model. So in other words, it's the data, it's used during the design, but in particular the training. The test data is data that's used to tune the model hyperparameters. So a hyperparameter would mean not a direct parameter like our betas, but some other parameter that we have to choose that affects the overall performance. So in this case, with polynomial regression, the model order would be the hyperparameter that we're, we're trying to choose or trying to tune and then the betas are the direct parameters. So that's what we're using the test data for, right? The test data is helping us choose the model order. As we said, the training data is not so useful for model order. So in altogether, we're using the training and the test both for the design of our model. <clears throat> but now someone could say, well, you know, since you've used the training and the test for the design of your model, you still need to validate whether your design is going to work well on some data you've never seen. And so this is where the validation data comes in. This is data that you're only allowed to use once you've completed the design of your model. So an example of where you'll encounter this is machine learning contests, like things you'll see on, on Kaggle. And we'll actually use Kaggle for the project at the end of the term. So there's going to be a contest, and people are given the data set, and they they will themselves split that data set into training and test to, to make their model, to design their model. But then finally, the people running the contest want to see whose model is really the best on some data that nobody has ever seen. And so they will hide a, a, a number of, of data points hide it away and these data points, no one will get to see them until the contest is over. And so this is, this is yeah, data that's used only after your design is finalized. If you would somehow get access to this validation data and say, oh, okay, I, I'm, I'm not doing that well. I, I see I should probably go back and, 
and make some more adjustments, at that point, you're actually using that validation data as you would be using test data, and it's no longer fair to even count it as validation data. So this validation data really must be held out and never used for design at all. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's where these three kinds of, of uh, data splits come from. But I also wanna point out that depending on who you talk to, they might swap the, the definitions of test and validation. They might say, well, your training data is what you train your coefficients on, your validation data is what you use to, to tune your model order and so on, and the test data is what's held out and you don't get to see. So there's, there's not really a consistent usage of these terms in the machine learning community. So you just have to be aware. Training data is very clear, but test and validation are these two other sets, but sometimes people refer to them in, in different ways. <clears throat> okay, and just final comment is in this unit, we have only been talking about training and test data. We have not really been talking about validation data, but I just wanted to mention it so that when you, when you go on uh, and you see this somewhere else, you know what's, you can understand what's happening. All right. So, um, so that's all I really wanted to say on K-fold cross-validation and cross-validation in general. Are there any questions on, um, on anything? The last chance to ask questions today on this. Okay, <clears throat> I don't see any questions. So let's move on to uh, the next section which is going to be a theoretical way of understanding all the things we've seen so far that will allow us to generalize it and um, and go a little bit deeper <clears throat> okay so for this we're going to so this is just kind of the motivation so <clears throat> and and what i'm talking about here is you could say is a, a very 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 introduction to uh, what they call statistical learning theory. So the, the theory of trying to understand how, you know, how learning works when you learn on a training data set, how much of what you learn transfers to data you haven't seen before and so on. Okay, so what we've seen so far in this unit is we focus on polynomial regression and we've seen that choosing the model order too small causes underfitting, choosing the model order too large because overfitting, but that we can choose uh, the model order ourselves from our data by minimizing test RSS through the process of cross-validation. The important thing to realize is that all of that is just one special case of a more general concept that occurs throughout machine learning, which is the, the following, models that are too simple cause underfitting and models that are too complex cause overfitting. And there's so many different ways in which the parameters we choose make our model more simple or more complex. Um, but model complexity as a whole can be optimized through cross-validation and in particular by minimizing the quantity mean squared error. So we're gonna define exactly what mean squared error is in a moment, but it's like a normalized version of RSS it's a little bit easier to work with analytically. Okay, and um, as we'll see, when we do our analysis of, of MSC, we're gonna encounter a very powerful concept called the bias variance equation, which shows us the trade-off explicitly for being too simple or too complex with our model. And <clears throat> we'll see that, the, that, that there's some point in the middle where we minimize MSC that gives us just the right trade-off between bias and variance. Okay, so to set everything up, we have to assume a statistical model that we can use for our analysis. And this model is very similar to the one that we use to generate the data for our polynomial um, experiment. So let's start, there's, there's a lot to talk about here. So first of all, as we see up here, this 
shows the way in which the, tr the, the data is generated. This is not about our model. This is what's actually going on in creating the data. So we can see that there are these feature vectors. There's some function of the feature vectors. So for example, we saw a polynomial function, but it could be anything. Then this is noiseless. Here, we're going to add some noise, epsilon. And that noise is on average zero with a variance of sigma squared. So this, this fancy E is what we call statistical expectation. It's the statistical average, statistical mean. And we'll, we'll learn, uh, I'm hoping you've seen this before, but I'm gonna review it, um, tell you all about it in case you need a reminder. But the point is, this is our way of saying that <clears throat> the noise here is zero on average and has a variance, a statistical variance of sigma squared. Once you add the noise to the noiseless model, um, you get the, the, the labels or the targets that you have observed in the data. So this model applies to both the training and the test data. So the training, uh, the training labels are generated in this way and the test labels are generated in exactly the same way. The difference between training and test is of course, certain features might be seen for training, other features you only see during test. And um, one, of, one other thing I, have, I didn't describe is that these, <clears throat> these noise realizations, these, these are independent over all the different samples we see. So it's like I'm, I'm just drawing random epsilons and um, for every training, uh, target I generate, I have a different epsilon. For every test target, I have a, a different drawn epsilon and so on. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well, but um, <clears throat> those are some of the intuitions. So, um, okay, those are the main, main things I wanted to talk about here. Let me just kind of highlight this, these things, because they're important. Um, okay, so now when I go to predict, um, predict one of these labels, I am going to use possibly a very different function. It's not going to be F. I'm going to give it a different name and give it F hat. So maybe, you know, F is some, uh, crazy function that's very complicated and I'm going to approximate it with a polynomial. So F and F hat are different. Um, but anyway, I, this is what I'm gonna choose for my model. As we know, our models are always parameterized by some betas, some coefficients. So uh, my model is gonna take in the features and the coefficients. And finally, the output of that is going to predict one of the test labels y. It's not going to be exactly equal to y. I'm going to call it y hat. It's the prediction of y. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so the first point is that when we think about these different quantities, we have to sort out in our minds which of these quantities are random and which quantities are non-random. So <clears throat> one of the things we said up here is that the noise, the noise is definitely random. Um, <clears throat> when, we, when we see our training data set, not only is the noise gonna be random, we also model the features as random. So here are the training specific quantities. These are the, the this is the, the noise on the IF training sample. And these are the features for the IF training sample. We're gonna think of both of those as random. And if those guys are random, 
finally, the beta hat that I get after I fit my parameters to this random training data is also going to be random. So this beta hat vector is random. You could think of it like this. Imagine that you're, you're doing many, many, many experiments. So in one experiment, someone gives you a set of, um, a set of training data and you, you fit your beta. And then you do it again. They give you another set of training data that's going to be different because it's randomly generated. And now you're going to get another beta hat. And you do this many, many, many times. <clears throat> so now you can see you have many, many different beta hats. And we can think of them all as, as random. Um, <clears throat> now, importantly, we're going to think of the test feature vector as non-random, or in, otherwise, in other words, deterministic. And we'll see that we want to do this because we want to ask the question, as I vary x in, in whatever manner I want, how exactly do my test feature, my test predictions change? So I want to keep my, my test feature vectors deterministic. So beta hats are random, but the x's are deterministic. And one last thing is that um, <clears throat> the the true test label is generated like this. So it also has some randomness from epsilon, but I'm going to make sure to acknowledge that the test noise epsilon is independent of my test feature. And it's also independent of everything that happened during training. So there's this statistical independence that's gonna help my analysis. So that's the setup of the model. We, we really have like two models, one is our prediction model, and then one is our the, the actual true model from which the data is generated. <clears throat> and finally, when we asked when we ask about performance, how do I measure performance? We're going to measure performance by mean squared error. So here is the definition on the right of mean squared error. This is the statistical expectation of the squared difference or the you know, statistical average of the squared difference between the test target and my prediction of the test target. And here, I wanna explain this notation. This bar here refers to what's called conditional expectation. And I'll describe that in just a moment. Conditional expectation says, if I fix X, then what is this average? So it's the average of this for a fixed value of X. And that's important because we're saying for a fixed deterministic feature vector, what is the error gonna be like? Is it gonna be big, small? And that may change as we look at different possible um, test feature vectors. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so with expectation, there's always the question, okay, if expectation is, is like doing a, an average over certain random quantities. Well, what are the random quantities to which this expectation is applied? Okay, what are the what's the randomness in here? There's really two pieces of randomness. There's the um, there's the noise that went into this test label. So that's one thing that we're expectation is taken over the test noise. The other random thing that went into this, remember, is the beta hats. Those affect y hats. Those are random. So the trained parameters, beta hat. So expectation is taken over those two things, epsilon and beta hat. But expectation is not taken over x. In fact, we're holding x fixed to compute this mean squared error. Okay, so that's the setup. Um, what I'm gonna do next time is I'm gonna kind of go back a couple steps and talk about expectation and conditional expectation and a bunch of the technical stuff that we used to set up this model. And once we have all those tools and a better understanding of all this stuff, then we can move ahead and do the actual analysis of this mean squared error. Now, if you want to get a jump on some of these concepts and you feel like your probability is a bit rusty, I have written 
a document on probability and expectation. It's just a, a review. It's similar in spirit to the linear algebra review, uh, the Stanford linear algebra review that I posted um, that helped you with homework zero. This is a similar document, but for probability and expectation, you can find it on the GitHub page. <clears throat> and because um, every semester I teach this, I get a lot of questions like, you know, where do, where do I look for background material? And I don't want you guys to go and, and feel like you have to read entire books on this. So I just wrote all the essentials in here. And um, please have a look at that if, if all this stuff I talked about today uh, expectation, all that. If that's not very familiar to you, then please do have a look at this, um, if possible, before Wednesday, so that when we go through this, it will make a lot more sense and you can ask remaining questions that you might have. But that will be the, our next task, is to go through, talk about expectation, conditional expectation, and finally do the, the main derivation of the equation um, <clears throat> that we need to do to, to really understand the big picture here. Okay, can you please a, a bit elaborate on the difference of RSS and MSE? Yes, that's a great question. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so RSS, <clears throat> there's basically two differences. So RSS, as we know, is the sum of our training samples, yi minus yi squared. <clears throat> Okay, and then this I is going over all our, our training, or maybe we could even say that this is going over our, our test. Um, yeah, let me, let me do that. So test, and I'll just call this uh, M, and I'll, I'll call it M, just to be a little bit brief. Okay, so this is RSS test. <clears throat> so one of the things you notice immediately that's a, a bit weird about this is that the, the more test samples I have, the larger this quantity gets. So it's not very convenient for analysis. So let's normalize it. Let's divide this by M, both sides. And now I have a quantity, which you can see is a sample average of the square difference between, uh, and let me, let me again emphasize, these are the test This is in like the test fold, test samples. These are not training. Okay, so that's what RSS tests would be. What's MSE? MSE would be the statistical average of essentially the same quantities. Okay, so the main difference here is we have a sample average, and here we have a statistical average. <clears throat> here we have a list of numbers given to us. Here we have what are called random variables. Random variables are objects that are, are different than just a regular number. A random variable, you can kind of think it, of it as you never know exactly the value it's going to take. You know things about the values it tends to take. You know the probability distribution and things like that, but you can never nail down the exact value. So here, everything is explicit. Everything is um, in front of you. Here, this is <clears throat> these these y's are are more like concepts. But finally, when if if you know the the, the distribution on these, you can compute the statistical average and you will get a fixed deterministic number. On the left here, actually it's a little bit tricky. So <clears throat> if, we, if we view these as deterministic numbers, then all I, I could, I just take the average and I get this fixed quantity. But as we know, as we saw over here, um, when I have different test folds, like come back to here, so these, you could kind of think about these as 10 different experiments I have where I am computing the sample average. And if I look at what's happening over those 10 different experiments, they're all differing a little bit in the results. And that's what gives me these error bars. <clears throat> so from that perspective, these would be random variables. 
And if I do this average of random variables here, I get more, I get another random variable. And so this thing is a little bit hard to nail down. This is something that um, I could take a sample average of this, and this is actually what's done exactly at the last step over here. This is my sample average of my test RSS, but that itself is uncertain. And that's where our error bars are coming from. And whereas this is a quantity that is completely certain, of course, we could also look at another quantity like the variance of this to get another indication of how much it's varying across our experiments. So again, the, the main answer, the difference is that is different concepts, statistical average versus sample average. These are two things that are different yet similar, but, but definitely different. So hopefully that helped in answering the question. Um, as we learn more about statistical expectation, I think this will be a bit more clear. All right, any other questions? Great, all right. Um, in that case, I uh, look forward to seeing you guys on Wednesday. I should be back in, um, in person on Wednesday. And uh, see you then. Have a good one.